All right, um, so thank you all. So um, my first duty tonight is to introduce someone who basically needs no introduction. Um, so Roger Barnes, dinghy cruiser extraordinaire, uh, author of The Dinghy Cruising Companion, president of the Dinghy Cruising Association, uh, videographer, uh, youth, <laughs> YouTuber, yachtsman, um, and I guess friend of, of most of us as well, either online or, or some of us in person as well. Um, so Roger's joining us from uh, Douane at the moment in, in France, so it's 11 a.m. there. And um, I'll throw to Roger, who hopefully can unmute himself this time. To unmute myself. Oh, I have to press that. That. And A. Uh, you are unmuted, Roger. You were. There we are. Yeah, right. Okay. There we go. You should hear me now. Can you all hear me? Hopefully. Yes. Very good. Yes. Um, I thought we were going to share a screen with some of my pictures on. Is that going to happen? Yes, just a second. <laughs> there we are. While I unmute myself, I caused confusion. Right. So I thought I'd show you some recent pictures. Um, just um, as an introduction, um, which you perhaps not have not seen before. This um, you may have done because it's actually on the cover of my second edition of my book. And this is actually sailing just here off the entrance to the harbour here at Duanane. Um, and it's my boat with a couple of reefs in the sail. It's quite a, a cold, windy day, as you can see. Shall we go on to the next one? Yep, there we are. Click. I'm not seeing it yet. What's happening? Sorry, I'll just see. It looks like my changed screens it have to reshare. Okay, how's that? Mm. Okay, this is um, in the Venetian Lagoon uh, where I went sailing last year. This is with a fleet of maybe mainly French boats. Um, and there we are, I'm in the lead, look at that. Well, other than the boat taking the picture. That is what the Venetian Lagoon, you know, around Venice looks like if you go sailing there. Okay, shall we do the next one? Oh, right, there we are. This is um, a little creek just around here. I, where I'm talking to you from is Western Brittany in France. And it has um, lots of narrow rear. Uh, it's a sort of flooded coastline. Um, and this is, uh, you know, geologically flooded coastline. So this is one of the rear. This was early this spring, um, a few months ago, spending a night up, um, up one of those rivers, a place called Le Fou. Shall we do another one? Oh, click. There we are. Oh, yes. This was, um, I've forgotten what pictures I chose. This is just two, three weeks ago. Um, a friend of mine wanted to go to a, a jazz festival in central Brittany. And there is actually a river sails past the jazz festival, a navigable river with locks. It's called the Olne. And so we went there and moored the boat in the river. Uh, so this is us just upstream in the distance. You can see one of the locks. And if we go to the next picture, I think there's a picture looking the other way, perhaps. There we are. Yes. And the other way you see that, say, this is my friend sitting on the, on the bank there. Um, there's actually a medieval bridge across the river. You can see there's a little church on the, on the hill above. So this is just, yes, there you are, showing the sorts of things you can do in a, in a cruising dinghy in, in five um, photographs. There you are. Anyway, now we're going to start doing questions, I think. 
Right, great, thank you. All right, so um, who has found the raise hand button so far? I'm actually not seeing anyone who's managed to find it yet. <laughs> okay, uh, Peter Green is first. Oh, I've got to start, Roger, by asking, what is your favourite snack when dinghy cruising? Oh, gosh. Favourite snack when dinghy cruising? Oh, I don't... It's, it's really strange, this, actually, because um, French food is very different from English food. And they're not very good at the sort of snacks I would usually have in, in Britain. Um, I suppose I usually have sort of... Um, you know, the sort of muesli bars when I'm in Britain, but they don't really do them. They're all a bit different. The French have, they either have proper, they either have um, the raw materials for proper meals or they have not very nice snacks. They don't, I think they sort of think that um, if you're not prepared to make a proper meal, you don't deserve to eat well. So it's actually quite, quite difficult. But then they have these things they called an apéro. There's a whole culture of apéros in France, which is basically you you go around somebody's house and you eat um, crisps and things like that. Uh, what sorry, what we in England call what in France they call chips. Um, heaven knows what you call them in Australia. I hope you call them crisps, so you know what I'm talking about. And you drink lots. And there's a whole sort of um, aisle in supermarkets french supermarkets for just for that they have the alcohol there and then all these snacks you see nibbles um but they're not really very good for eating in a boat so it's a constant problem actually in france is is having snacks to eat i tend to have things like bananas and stuff like that now because that's the only solution to that problem so there you are cheers You're not so superstitious about carrying bananas on a boat, Roger? Oh, is there a, is there a problem with carrying? Oh, maybe this is what the, the <laughs> why I have so many problems. I didn't know that. Was there a thing about... I thought it was rabbits you weren't meant to have or talk about. Uh, in, in Australia, sometimes it's bananas, but I, I actually thought that was international. I thought that was because banana boats tended to be um, disaster prone. <laughs> But, um, I've never, yeah. I've never heard that. But we, you, you're not allowed to mention rabbits. That's a favourite, a, a famous uh, prohibition in. But not that there should be any reason to mention rabbits on a boat. But yeah, you're not meant to talk about rabbits. So bear that in mind if you ever come to Britain. Okay, so next is uh, Paul de Rosa from Sailing Cat Louise. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Paul. Nope, still on mute, Paul. No, nope. uh, Paul, you're on mute still. Okay, um, so while Paul tries to unmute himself, uh, David, Pop, did you have a, a question? Yeah, yeah, I'm um, just um, interested in uh, the, um, there's a, a fellow that uses a ROG 15, um, who is, um, sails frequently in France and also in Mirabar and stuff. Yes. Um, uh, uh, just interested in his boat and how well it sails and what you think of it and... William, yes. Um, <laughs> William thinks I don't like his boat. So he's always saying, I know you don't like this boat, but it's really good. Um, I've not sailed it. it we, we, I've sailed along with him on a number of events and they tend to be a bit competitive. So there isn't time to sort of go off and sail in somebody else's boat. You've got, you know, such a, a battle to get somewhere all together and then you're there and then you're eating or something like that or sleeping or going to the pub or whatever it is 
So I've never had a chance to sail it, but it is very fast. It's quite interesting. It's always it's a speck in the distance ahead because it's got two masts and um, and a big running bowsprit. So it sets lots of big black sail. Right? It's not very slender, but it can carry lots of sail, which seems to make it very quick. And it's got a little cabin with cushions and everything. It's not a cuddy. It's a proper little cabin. It's got a space for a, for a cooker in there. So, um, yeah, it's it's funny. It's not at all traditional like my boat, but that's not necessarily you know an advantage being traditional it's got these rolling um masts the masts rotate so he can furl away the sails and reef really quickly so yeah it's very it's very interesting it, it's got um oh the other thing it's got he experimented with um with what you call them hydrofoils it's got sort of hydrofoil lee boards which he bought, you can, some other boat has them, you know, because they're, they're the thing now, aren't they, on racing yachts, that they lift the hull slightly out of the water. The, you know, racing yachts don't tend to actually lift out of the water, but they lift slightly out of the water. Um, but they don't seem to work. The, the Hydra Falls don't seem to work. So last time um, I went sailing, which was just a few weeks ago with him, um, which was in Holland, just come back from Holland, um he he didn't have the hydrofoils he just taken them off so yeah there you are so the hydrofoils don't work but uh it's it's really interesting boat but the him he was hoping that he would be able to sell it that they it would be part of a series but is it, as is always the case with little cabin boats he discovered um that they they're difficult to make for the sort of price someone's prepared to pay for for what's it's 15 foot boat it's the same length as my dinghy mm -hmm. but a lot more expensive because it's got a cabin and two masts and all this sort of thing so he'd need to he'd need to sell the boat for i don't know sorry i'll talk euros i don't know what the conversion is but sort of thirty five thousand euros he was talking about which is yeah, well, you probably can just translate that straight into New Zealand, into Australian dollars. It's probably, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. So, yeah, I just don't think there are people out there wanting to buy small boats for that amount of money. So it's rather sad. It, that sort of thing means that we don't get the development of boats like that, really, unless you're prepared to make them, make them yourself. So it's a so, light yeah. ply, sort of a, is it made of flight plywood? It's made of plywood, yeah. He had he had it made here in France by a, a guy called Emmanuel Conrad, who is who has a um, a sort of boatyard um, called Arwen Marine, who are worth googling. Actually, they make very interesting boats. Um, but Arwen Marine isn't. It's not an Arwen Marine boat. Um, it, William just used Arwen Marine to build it. Um, I can't remember the name of the designer. He's a Frenchman, and he designed this this boat. and And William, um, you know, sort of bought the rights to the design. So yeah, you will see. I will. I did film a bit of a talk with him, um, which should come out in my next video when I have time to actually <laughs> to actually edit it together. Um, and he's sort of sitting there in his little cabin because it works very well. He, you know, he has a little cabin in the bow and then it's open at the back and there's no transom. So any water that comes aboard just sort of whooshes out. Um, it's not the sort of boat you could really sail with a with a family. That's the thing. It's very much, you know, one of these boats that's really set up for one person or maybe two people to sail. Um and very definitely that's what it does, um, you know, and then sleep aboard. So, yeah. Yeah, the ROG 15, there we are. Yeah, 15 foot long, there you are. That's why it's called a ROG 15. <laughs> right, cool. Uh, so, Paul, can I have another try? Paul the Riser? Yeah. I, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Roger, being an architect, you're obviously a builder of things. Had you ever considered building your own boat? Ah, well, being an architect, I know how difficult it is to build things. 
<laughs> it's like it's like architects don't necessarily build their own houses they you know one one understands the uh, the skill of being a builder um whenever i have an architectural commission and people are saying oh maybe i should just employ a lot of subcontractors and and organize the construction of whatever i want to do myself this is people who, who tend to be house owners I always tell them, no, no, you have no idea how hard it is. Just use a builder and give the job to a builder and the builder can then employ all the tradesmen and deal with the, the coordination and so on. Um, you know, I do I do all, all the maintenance on my boat myself. Um, and that seems to be as much as that seems to take an, an awful lot of time. Yeah, I'm meant to be going sailing this weekend, as we were talking about earlier um to the Les Îles Chauze which are on the north coast of off the north coast of Brittany and it's basically a load of rocks and a, a small inhabited island um and it's French it's part of the Channel Islands which are mostly British but this one is actually French um and in order to do that I had to repair one of my oars which had got cracked um, and so I spent sort of half of yesterday just doing that, just putting a couple of splices, um, stainless steel rod, you know, cutting a couple of grooves in the oil and setting in stainless steel rod. That took hours. You know, it sounds simple, you know, with an angle grinder, but yeah, you know, it's extraordinary how long even a simple thing like that takes. So, um, yes, I'm very happy to, to for someone else to build a hull and I do the adaptation. Hey. And can I can I just follow up with uh, I presume you left England because of Brexit. Why did you choose Douarnenez as somewhere to live in France? Um, yes, uh, the the Brexit thing. Um, you know, I do say that people ask why did you move to France, and I say Brexit, and it is sort of true but it's also really just accelerated something I'd always thought I might do. And it became, it's now really difficult a uh, British person to move to France. You've got to get visas and prove that, you know, you're not taking a job away from anyone in the EU and all sorts of things like that. It's suddenly really difficult. Whereas um, just a few years ago, you could just move here and bang, that was fine. You know, so, I sort of thought, well, um, if I'm going to, if I am thinking of doing this, now is the time to do it because, well, I still have free movement. So that's um, what I did. Why I chose Duanane? Um, I, I did know Duanane. Um, so there's a bit of a boring answer to this. I wanted to carry on working in Britain. So I needed to be somewhere in France that I could get backwards and forwards. And the, it really came down to a choice between ferry ports because I decided I was going to do this on a ferry, not on an aeroplane for complicated and rather boring reasons. I was going to use ferries. And so I either had to live and it ended up being I either had to live near Roscoff, one ferry port, or San Marlo, another ferry port. And they're at both ends of Brittany. San Marlo's at the eastern end of Brittany, which is a long peninsula, yeah. going out into the Atlantic. And uh, Roscoff is at the other end. And Duanane is just south of Roscoff. And um, the sensible thing, if you, live, if you live in a country like France, which, you know, is quite big, um, it takes a whole day to drive across France. You know, it's quite big for a European country. It's nothing compared to Australia. Um, <laughs> Uh, what you want to do is to live near the centre of it, don't you? You don't want to live right on one edge, looking at the Atlantic, you know, with America being the nearest place in one direction. Um, and I'd done exactly the same thing, because where I lived in Britain, there's a peninsula in the southwest of, of, of England, um, which is the same size as Britain, it's just a little bit more to the north. And I lived at the sensible end, at the eastern end, near the rest of the country. And I thought, I'm old enough... I'm old enough now to just do something stupid and live, you know, live right at the other end. So that's really, I just thought it would just be fun and different. And it's a fishing port and, you know, it's got a particular culture of a place that's right on the edge of, you know, of, of a country. So, yeah, 
So that's that's why I'm here really. It is it's nice, nice being here, but it's not particularly convenient for the rest of France. <laughs> Okay, uh, so next is uh, Gary Hardy from Melbourne. Hello, Roger. Um, first of all, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank you for your wonderful book and your marvellous videos. I, I look forward to them, you know. And thank I'm, you. I want you to get back to getting the next one out as soon as we finish this session. Um, <laughs> but um, my, my question is, it seems to me you're uniquely placed to, to, to have some thoughts about the... Um, the impact that geography and climate and culture have on the way that dinghy cruising evolves. It seems to me that there's a very different sort of scene The you know, the English dinghy cruising association, the French chaps, the Venetians, the, you know, the Dutch. Um, what, what do you think are the, the key drivers for how a dinghy cruising will evolve in any particular area? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think we're, I think we're growing together. Things like this. Suddenly, we're all sort of talking to each other and finding out what what we all do. And there are things like Facebook and so on. So um, I think we all we were all off in our own little worlds not so long ago. When I first started being in the Dinghy Cruising Association, it was just this odd odd little community of people who were crazy enough to cruise in dinghies and you you didn't feel we were one didn't feel we were part of a movement or anything we were just people who weren't rich enough to own yachts <laughs> it was it was just as simple as that uh, it was a cheap way to to go cruising and um yeah whereas whereas now suddenly with uh, you know with people like john wellsford over in new zealand producing boats that are absolutely unashamedly for dinghy cruising it's um yes it's sort of turned into something different and one does suddenly feel and this is as much a shock to me as to anyone that we're we're actually part of something almost trendy you know we 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 feel like we 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 won the argument and and when um as as i was when we were in holland we were sailing there were there were 12 boats um, and we were sailing between various ports and because it was this was organized by French people in Holland so um, it was somewhere foreign and they were worried about us just pitching up places and camping on the shore that that might not be allowed so we basically sailed between marinas and they're very nice marinas Holland is extraordinarily civilized country with lovely facilities and these marinas were really close to towns. So it wasn't, you know, it was it was very pleasant. But nonetheless, we did arrive in marinas, and there were all these lines of white yachts, and then there were our twelve boats with all our little tents. And you you then would look across the rest of the marina and think, what what do they think they're doing in these big boats? You know what? It, they we clearly look like we're doing something that's much more um, sympathetic to. To the environment and and so on, and then they're all they're all in these things that are a bit like floating caravans, really. And of course, we were the only boats in the marina with tents on. You know that was there was us, and, and you know we would sail in and create this little Bedouin encampment in one corner of the marina, and then sail off again the next day, and leave all these rows of yachts which mostly weren't going anywhere. Uh, though I have to say the Dutch are very good at sailing rather than keeping boats in marinas and not using them as compared to other countries. But nonetheless, there's still this sense that most of these, that you've actually entered something a bit like a floating car park, isn't there? And um, yes, and we're, I think we're sort of, you know, doing something different. I would hope um, that Yes, that that some that dinghy cruising can become less of a niche and much more of, of of a normal way to to go sailing, and that that I would hope would be the future. Mm -hmm. Let's hope. Yep. Is that an answer to your that, question? That's a good, no, that's I, a good answer. <laughs> I, I suppose the, the reason behind my question is is um, I unlike all the rest of the people here, I come from Melbourne. 
And right. we have one Ooh. very large bay here, which is mm. sort of like 240 mm. kilometres around the perimeter. And it, it, it somehow dinghy cruising doesn't seem to have caught on down here as well as, you know, as evidenced by the people sitting around. Um, Sydney, you know, we look look to the north and Sydney with all its nice little um, interesting places to get to easily and, mm. you know, somehow I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm looking for um, for you to say, oh, it's geography is the key, key uh, thing and, and the reason why no one will take it up with you, wants to sail with you is because the geography is poor or something like that. You know, I think, no, I, that's very accurate. Yes, I think that's quite right, um, because occasionally people say to me, um, you know, why don't you have a faster boat? There were faster dinghies than my dinghy. And I say, well, it doesn't matter. You, you decide how long you want to sail for. Sort of six hours is probably quite good, and then you've got probably about an hour to get out of port at one end and an hour in to port the other end, so that's more up and everything. So that's sort of eight hours, and that's quite nice time to to be sailing and you you just um pick a port that you're aiming for that is six hours sail away that's simply what you do and also if you've got a faster boat you'll just pick somewhere a bit further away but yeah. the, the experience will be the same yeah. but that only works if you've got a choice of, yeah. of places to sail to obviously yeah. um you know if you if you live somewhere with big open expanses between harbors then yachts work really well. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to do big voyages in the open sea. Um, yeah, you know, yachts, yachts are the answer. Dinghies are very much, I think, uh, boats that you use very close in shore amongst the shoals. Um, and this is why I'm actually writing another, a new book at the moment, which is one of the things that um, is distracting me from making videos. And it's called Sailing the Shallows. And the idea is that that's what um, what dinghies are about, really, is we we sail in shallow waters in interesting, you know, in the fringes of the ocean. And um, and I think part of what dinghy cruising is about is saying that's that's what um, it would be good for people to do. It is an environment that's interesting and, and a small open dinghy is a really good way of yep. of, of exploring it. And whereas something like, you know, even a, a sort of a 35 foot yacht, you know, standard size yacht, they struggle in that sort of area because they're worried about running aground and, and all sorts of things like that. A dinghy can sort of get into those areas. But yes, you need to live somewhere or live yeah. near somewhere that's, yeah. that's like that. Yeah. I don't really know Melbourne, though I can picture a map of Australia and I know where it is sort of down the bottom there. Yeah. Um, I've no real idea what it's, what it's coastlines like. Well, yeah, but well, your big problem, your big problem, I'm sorry, it's your own fault for choosing Australia to live, yes. is that you're in the middle of the Southern Ocean and there are these yeah. great winds racing around the world. You know, as soon as you get a little bit offshore, oh. you're in a really serious oh. part of the world. It's bad enough being in the North Atlantic, but oh. in the Southern Ocean, it's, <laughs> it's got an even worse reputation. So, yeah, there you are. Yeah, I can okay. see why sailing around Sydney Harbour and all those little um, bays up that coast, the, the east coast, is, is much easier. Thank you. Yeah. And um, it was interesting when you mentioned that you had the, the parking lot of, of white boats as well. So um, in Sydney, we tend to have the clusters of the, the white boats. We call it the, the white goods section. So. In Australian English, that means the place you go in the department stores to buy fridges and washing machines and those sort of things. Mm -hmm. uh, next is uh, Ian. Uh, hi, Roger. Thanks for your um, thanks for your work. I've really appreciated it and and your effort and time going to to making videos. They're fantastic. I, I loved your video about rebuilding belonging. And so my question, in a sense, follows on from Gary's. Just thinking about the the social aspect of dinghy cruising. Um, looking around the screen, and with apologies to Meredith, who was here before. Uh, it, it seems that we're all kind of men of a certain age <laughs> and, and perhaps a certain life stage. 
I was just wondering on your reflections on the social aspect, um, what events and, and activities tend to draw in um, a, a broader range of people uh, to the sport? You, you mentioned, you know, perhaps stinging cruising is, is gaining popularity and, and not being so much a niche thing, but gaining a broader appeal. You know, is it okay that we're all uh, middle-aged blokes is that a concern for us? Should we try and be more inclusive, or is you know sailing in a small boat that can take one or or maybe two people at a pinch? Is it just the nature of the beast? What's your reflections on that? Well, it's very definitely true um, that you know the demographic thing um, at the moment, and it's also true of who looks, my, looks at my videos because. Um, YouTube have uh, very sophisticated analytics. So I know where you all live <laughs> and how old you all are and what sex you are and all that sort of thing. And yes, you're mostly, <laughs> you're mostly men in your 50s and 60s, I'm afraid. There you are. <laughs> so yes, I, I, I'm really, really predominantly so. So, um, and that is also true of the membership of the cruising association um i do however have um a number of friends who are women and they have you know they sail on their own in in little dinghies um so i have a an unrepresentative sample of people who are who are different to that and the this going sailing this weekend is um there's going to be another boat which is called bigfoot which is about the same size as my law it's a rather traditional boat rather similar She's actually, she's French and lives in Switzerland, but she's in Normandy at the moment. And uh, she said, oh, you want to come sailing to the Ile Chose? And there you are. So that's all, this is all her idea, what we're doing. So there you go. And she has, yes, it's a little camping boat, which she, you know, has done all the work on. She sets up on her own and yeah, and there's a, there's a sort of footprint on the sail like Bigfoot, you know, Bigfoot were the this mythical beast in Canada. And the, and she's got that all over her sailing smock as well, these sort of bare feet and so on. So she's really into it. So um yeah, so and and the strange thing is that um you know I'm not one of these people who thinks that all the differences between the sexes are simply due to inculturation. I think there is a you know there are other things going on as well. Uh, big and <laughs> big and rather controversial subject but that's where i sort of come to that i think that you know there, there are certainly um differences um that we can we can sort of uh, see if we do very psychological studies um and so there are going to be things that attract men and there are going to be things that attract women um naturally but there again there is an enculturation thing going on as well and i rather suspect that's more powerful with boats actually because i think there's an awful lot about um sailing dinghies and camping upon on dinghies that you would have thought would appeal to to women as well if you take a normative view of what women like because it is sort of like homemaking and stuff like that and and dinghies are small and cute and women tend to like small cute cars um you know if you look at the sort of cars that are attracted to women so i would have thought I, I rather think it's just that it, it's it's less of a thing that that um, women think they can do. Um, you know, it's not sort of really occurred to them yet. And I would hope that that would would change. I used to write for a magazine, a sailing magazine called Dinghy Sailing Magazine here in Britain. Oh, sorry, I'm here in France, but here in Europe, and it was in Britain, and uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but I was doing this sort of, um, you know, up to about 10 years ago. And the whole magazine was run by women. And it was about dinghy sailing rather than dinghy cruising. Uh, I wrote the dinghy cruising articles, but they were they were all mostly interested in, in you know, little racing dinghies, but little dinghies. And we'd go to edit. I'd go to editorial meetings and there would be 10 women and there would be me. And another guy who wrote sort of historical articles about um, dinghies as well, I forget his name, but 
yeah, he, he's still doing it. He still writes historical articles about dinghies. All the rest of them. And we were middle-aged men and they were all in their sort of 20s. It was extraordinary. We almost felt like, you know, there was some... We <laughs> occasionally meet in bars and restaurants and we'd, I'd look across the room and think, well, what, what, are the, what do people think is going on here with all these young women, <laughs> two middle-aged men? And that's what it was. We were, we were having an editorial meeting about, about dinghies. So, you know, club dinghy racing and so on is um, popular, particularly for young women. The other thing I should say, just sort of warming to my theme, um, I'm on a committee of the Royal Yacht Association, which is the governing body for the sport of sailing in Britain. And they, um, this committee is to promote dinghy cruising. So it is the dinghy cruising committee because the Royal Yacht Association did a survey of all its members in recent years, and it's got like 160,000 members. And it also did a survey of all its affiliated sailing clubs, and virtually every sailing club in Britain is affiliated to the Royal Yacht Association. So they did this survey, and most dinghy sailing clubs are set up to organise races. That's what they do. They're racing. They've got a racing program. And um, but even those sailing clubs, when they polled their members, they found that a majority of members preferred cruising. And by cruising, I mean just, you know, go for a picnic. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean using a tent, but just not racing anyway. And so the Royal Yacht Association then thought, dear me, a majority of the people interested in dinghy sailing want to cruise. They don't want to race. So we've completely missed this. And we better talk to the experts on this. And they thought, who are the experts? Oh, it might be the Dinghy Cruising Association. So suddenly we had all these phone calls from the RYA saying, oh, you know about dinghy cruising. Come on these committees. Let's talk about how we can promote this. And the person who is organizing this is a middle-aged woman um, called Michelle. Uh, so she's the RYA official tasked with getting people to do, go dinghy cruising. And she's saying this, why, why are there so few people like me dinghy cruising? And we've got to do something about this. So she's setting up all sorts of um, surveys to find out why, why middle-aged women aren't going dinghy cruising. So hopefully we'll find out and we'll know, and we'll be able to solve it. But I, I have to say, I'm quite relaxed about it. I think just as it, I think it's just a case of getting a critical mass of, of women doing it. And then suddenly people will realize, you know, people, I mean, other women will say, oh, I could do that. It's simply, a, you know, seeing role models, I think. There you are. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't think we have to do something. I think it just needs, you know, need some some examples of people doing it. Uh, Meredith, do you have anything to add there? You're being 4% of our membership at the moment. Uh, well, um, I, I, I suppose, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, uh, I, I feel like I'm slight, a bit of an imposter because I, I've been sort of hanging around in this group and posting occasionally, and we do have a dinghy, um, which is a cruising dinghy. <clears throat> but we, I, I've never done any of your overnight kind of um, cruises, although we've been very close in the Mile Lakes, um, coinciding by one day. Um, uh, yeah, look, <laughs> I, I know um, this subject has been broached before, but I, I do think that the the issue of toilets is is does affect women um, more than men. Um, and I, I, I sort of had the experience of growing up um, sailing uh, uh, a very racy yacht um, uh, in, in my childhood with no toilet. Um, and we, we mostly cruised, not, uh, not um, raced, although my father did race originally. Um, so I sort of had that, that experience um, from, from uh, very early in my life. But um, uh, I think it is, it is, especially as women get older too, I think it becomes more of an issue. Um, I won't go into the details, um, but some of you can probably fill in the blanks. Um, 
uh, I think the, the idea of overnighting in a dinghy is, is a bit tricky. Um, and, uh, but that, I mean, it's something that could potentially be solved and has been, I think, in some parts of um, the cruising world, um, the Gippsland Lakes, the Mile Lakes, places like that where there are, there are some camping facilities. And um, uh, I think encouraging the powers that be to, you know, come on board with that sort of stuff might be helpful. Um, the other thing is, uh, it's a very gadgety sort of hobby, isn't it? I mean, people are always talking about their kind of stuff and how they do things and um, their gear. And I mean, I find that quite interesting too, but um, it, it is a bit of a kind of boy's pastime, I think. That, that's, I know that's not very PC what I've said. But. <laughs> right, cool. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, Bruce Dyson-Smith, you're next. Yep. Yeah, hi, Roger. Um, Hello. The I had was uh, more about your background as far as did you, have you always been dinghy cruising or have you come from a yachting background or vice versa? Um, like I know a lot of us are stepping back from bigger boats into dinghy cruising as we seem to be getting older. <laughs> oh, well, there you are. This is the book I'm writing at the moment. And I was actually just um, working on it before we started doing this. It's um, it's uh, midday here in France, just so you know. It's light outside the window. There you are. Uh, so I was I was actually sort of doing this work this morning. Um, I uh, was born in the the northwest of England um, in what's now called Cumbria. Um, which is the Lake District. And when my parents moved the family a little bit to the south to, to a county called Lancashire, which is rather flatter, um, they found they missed the hills of uh, the, the Lake District. And so we started renting a, a little, a tiny, tiny little flat converted out of a barn on the shores of Windermere, one of the lakes in the Lake District. From this is from the age of six, and uh, having started doing that, my parents realised they never ex intended to go sailing. You know, the, the the idea was we'll get in the hills, and this flat, which some friends were also renting, uh, came available. So we started doing that, and then they realised you couldn't you couldn't spend all your holidays because we spent all our holidays there. This is uh, fifty years ago. People didn't have lots of holidays, so we always just went to the Lake District. And um, you couldn't do that and not have a boat. So we bought a boat and so we took up sailing. So I've been sailing dinghies since then, since the age of six. Um, and I did, um, I've just, <laughs> just been editing these chapters. Uh, we stopped going to the Lake District after a while and dinghy sailing began to be a bit difficult because I was the only one in the family interested and I had all those problems of how do you get to the boat when you don't have a car because I was too young to drive a car and all those sorts of things so I, there was and then you go to go to university as a student and dinghies are even more difficult so I did have a number of years like that and then finally I bought another dinghy when I had a house and a car again I thought oh we can I can own a dinghy so I so I bought a dinghy I suppose in my um this was would be about in my early 30s early 40s they uh, yeah early 30s there we are and um yes yeah, so so that was baggy wrinkle the the wooden 12 footer um and I'd always meant to do proper dinghy cruising so I you know that was what I did aboard that boat then I did have a few years of yacht ownership um because that always seems like yes the next step is to own a yacht so i did for four or five years have a 30 foot yacht uh, an old harrison butler a 1930s wooden classic yacht did a lot of sailing in that and didn't sail the dinghy at all because yachts are old wooden yachts are so much effort and money and and everything um, and then finally, out of um, various accidents in 
my life in terms of changing jobs and where I was going to live and so on, it seemed sensible to sell the yacht. I thought if I can, I can buy another yacht again, but for a few years, I won't be able to go yacht sailing. And it, the sensible thing, rather than shut it up, and is to sell, you know, sell the yacht and then buy another one. Um, but in the meantime, I went back to dinghy sailing um, and I thought, oh, this has got so many advantages. So that's when I bought the Allure, because uh, it was also when I was being asked to start writing about dinghy cruising for this dinghy sailing magazine, which I've just talked about, you know, the one run by all the 20 year old women. And um, so now I've so I suppose I I can't really go back to sailing yachts because I would be letting the side down and, and <laughs> so I'm trapped but um yeah I I for a long time I did that my my attitude was that you have a dinghy for ordinary sailing you know for at weekends and then for summer holidays you charter a yacht which you can chart do anywhere so instead of having a yacht somewhere let's say in Sydney Harbour yeah a new lot um and then you can't go you know you can't sail to new zealand from sydney harbour and in, in, well you can theoretically but not in a, a two-week holiday so you're sort of stuck just sailing around there if you wanted to sail around the coast of new zealand the sensible thing to do is to fly to new zealand and charter a yacht there and then you can um, enjoy new zealand but if you're going to do that why do you own a yacht at all why not just charter so that was the argument. I could experience more of, of the world if I chartered yachts. And so for a long time, that's what I did. But recently, I more recently, I discovered I missed the dinghy when I was in a yacht. Because you sail, you sail and you arrive somewhere, you drop anchor and there's this lovely anchorage. And you think, oh, it'd be really nice to just sail around. And all you've got is this rubber dinghy and an outboard motor. And you go around. That isn't particularly enjoyable and it's noisy and I always thought that the, the 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 yacht gave up just when the sailing got interesting just as you got into a you know an interesting little anchorage with lots of little islands and things that's when you put the anchor down because it's just so stressful sailing you know in shallow water in in a yacht uh, around where I sail we have big tidal ranges so it, you know you can't even just look at the chart and avoid the shallows because you know, you've got to think about 10 metres of tidal range, um, you know, causing confusion on top of all that. Uh, I don't I have actually no idea what the tidal range is in Australia, but just in case you are wondering, we have big tidal ranges around here. So, um, yeah, so that just, yes, the whole thing, it just seems more fun, really, in a small boat. So that's that's where, you know, what I've what I'm um, evangelising at present. <laughs> you are. Yeah, that, that pretty much covers it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so next we've got an online question from Brooks Coretta, um, who has COVID, so um, can't speak properly. Um, so I'd like to ask Roger if he's ever been tempted to add an engine to Avildro, Drow, and what is the main reason for not having one? Oh, um, when... When I um, when I had the Tideway, I did quite often put a, an outboard aboard. I had a Seagull engine, Seagull's popular old fashioned engine in Britain. Um, and I very often used it for when we were day sailing, because you know with an engine, as soon as you turn the engine on, that you're going to go at, let's say, three knots in a straight line back to where you started from so you can sail around all day and if the wind drops you know you know we've got to turn the engine on at let's say 4 p.m and then we, we can get back and then we'll be in time for the pub because when you go day sailing uh, with British people they always want to get to the pub at seven o'clock they don't like getting back at nine o'clock when the pub stopped serving food they get really grumpy so your engine can solve that so I often had an engine but not really for dinghy cruising for overnight because it was just uh, there wasn't really space in the boat for an outboard motor and two people in a 12 foot dinghy. So that was was how I sailed then. When I bought the Allure, um, it didn't really have a way of 
mounting an outboard on it because it's got quite a high sloping transom. And I did actually adapt the transom so I could put an outboard on it. And that adaptation is still there. I've actually, and so I cut a slot that the outboard could go in. And recently, because in my early videos, there were so many complaints about this slot in the transom, I actually made a piece that slides in, that fills in the slot. So we mostly sail with the slot filled in. So it's it's not particularly visible, but it is still there and, and an outboard can be mounted on. Um, but I just found I didn't really ever take the outboard with me. And now I don't, I no longer actually have an outboard that works. They've all seized up or, uh, well, they're not working. I, I still have them. They're in, they're in Britain. Um, it's a little bit of a problem getting them to France at the moment, which I shan't bore you with, but it's slightly complicated caused by COVID and things. Um, so I do, yes, I do own outboard motors and I could get them to work or I could buy another one. But the, I just, I, I find that there's all, it's never actually necessary to use one. If you don't have an outboard, of course, you're never tempted to just turn the outboard motor on. You always try and do something else like row or, um, you know, go into the shallows or go somewhere else. If you're not actually having to get back that night, you just go somewhere else. And somewhere else you go to, you know, you, you sort of think, oh, it's taking a long time to get to our destination. Is there anywhere else we can go? And you get the chart out and you think, oh, look, there's that little inlet over there. Have you ever been in there? You say to the other person, but no, I've never been there. Oh, let's go and have a look. And very often you find somewhere really interesting you never thought that you'd ever go into, uh, which you've never heard anyone else going into, because, of course, all the pilot books are written for yachts, not for little dinghies. So, um, yes, that sort of happenstance of just finding somewhere to go into. There is also the exercise thing. If you know, do you know there are, there are gymnasiums with rowing machines? People, people row in gymnasiums. If you row in the open sea when you're actually going somewhere and doing something and it's it's got some point to it. Um, I don't know about around where you are, but around where I am here, suddenly boats converge on you from all directions, offering you a tow because they cannot believe you want to row in the open sea. It's a little bit different if you row up a river. That's sort of normal. But rowing in the open sea, you know, with <laughs> nothing in sight. You know, the, a, a distant horizon with maybe, you know, sort of miles away. Yes, people cannot believe you're doing this as a serious pastime. And so it's actually, if you ever want to tow, it's a really good way of getting a tow. You just start rowing and then, and then you know, you get offers of toes. Yeah, that actually works here as well. Turn them down or occasionally I say, yes, yes, you know, because that's the thing you can, if you want to tow, that's, that's the thing to do. You can get a tow. But I don't actually very often get a tow. It has happened. And it, when it happens, it's usually because there are other boats I'm trying to catch up if I'm in a group and I've slipped behind and some yacht comes along and says, would you like a tow? I think, oh, that might be a good idea. But, it, but if I were on my own, I would probably say, well, I'm good. I would say no, because I'd find somewhere else to go. Um, the thing, I'm sorry, I'm, I shall... I shall um, go on a bit more about this the people who have boats with engines and if it's a small boat you're turning the engine on because it's a flat calm so you know what you're saying is oh well what happens if the wind drops i can turn the engine on. so just think about the other boat you know there's another boat in the distance ahead of you and you come you come putting up alongside and you pass them and you you vanish away over the horizon in the front. Meanwhile, that other boat, that other boat was sailing along, thinking, oh, this is really nice and peaceful. And, and isn't, this, isn't this lovely? And we're just dribbling along through the water at sort of one or two knots. And then suddenly there's this noise. And this noise goes on for a lot longer than you. You're, you don't notice. You with your outboard motor, you don't realise how annoying it is for that other boat that isn't getting any of the benefit of this noise. It's not being pushed along. It's just hearing the noise. And then when you vanish your head, it gets the smell of two-stroke oil, if it's an old-fashioned two-stroke engine. So it gets the smell as well. And all that, and no benefit. 
And I don't think people with engines really realize how antisocial they are because they're so used to noise in their lives. And if you sail without an engine, you it, there really is just the wind and the water, and so on. That's what the, you know, what the experience is, and and more and more, it's a bit like it's very like smoking actually. You know, back in the day, we all were used to everyone smoking, and even if you didn't smoke, you just accepted that trains and buses and everything were full of smoke. And now you think back, how did we put up with that? Why did we put up with that? And it's a bit like that. They're, 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 yeah, I think maybe electric engines avoid many of these problems. But um, yeah, there is something, there is something deeply antisocial. I am, I have to say about outboard motors. There you are. If you, if you, you, you ask the questions. There you are. You're getting the. <laughs> you're getting my reply. So there you are. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Paul again. Paul Dwaza. Uh, you're on mute again, Paul. There we go. I didn't realise you had to do it every single time. <laughs> Roger, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think our little dinghy cruising group in Australia is growing, or it seems to be growing, and Australia tends to be 10 or 15 years behind Europe, so hopefully we'll keep growing and growing and growing, because we watch some of your videos and we're just blessed with the weather we have compared to the weather you seem to have over there. <laughs> As, as a kid, did you ever manage to go to the Earl's Court boat show? Because for me, growing up in England, that was like heaven. Millions of different dinghies. It was just the most amazing experience ever. Yes, you ever no, I went, I, went, I, I went on the train with a friend when I was a teenager. And we went to the, yeah, the Earl's Court when it was still, it doesn't exist anymore, but we did, yes. Oh, yeah. well, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> no, it absolutely doesn't. There isn't a London boat show anymore. No, the Southampton is the big boat show now. Wow. But it's very different. Yeah. Wow. Well, I've got nothing else. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> You've crushed his dreams now. Okay. Um, so Simon Bunker is next. Uh, hi, Roger. It's good to see you. Um, I know you've been on a big trip to New Zealand before. I was just wondering if you'd got any other plans to go far afield and if you'd ever come to Sydney at some point. Um, I, 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 I would, I, I had fun, I do actually have relatives in Australia and when I went to, um, and I have relatives in New Zealand, and when I went to New Zealand, I did sort of think maybe I should go to Australia as well. But, um, you know, one only has a certain length of holiday because I do work. And, um, of course, from viewed from up here, Australia and New Zealand seem very close together. But, of course, they're not. It's a substantial trip to move between them. And when I sort of thought about it, well, actually, it's much more sensible to just go to Australia, not try and sweep it into a, um, you know, a trip to New Zealand, really. Um, that would just make the New Zealand trip shorter, basically. So because uh, when I was in New Zealand, I did go to Wellington and Auckland and those places. So, um, yeah, no. So, yes, I there's lots of places I have been to. Um, there again, I am sort of quite um, keen on the idea that you 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 pick a corner of the world and you explore it properly. So yeah, all this, um, yeah. But no, I I and I probably would actually go to um, or come to Sydney because that's where many of my relatives live. Actually, is in the Sydney area. Though I've got some others that live over in Perth. So that's the trouble. Is I come to Australia, I'm going to end up having to go to both Perth and Sydney. So that's part of the trouble. <laughs> so there you are. And they're not very close together either, even though they look like it from this side of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, 
If you make it to Sydney, then you're, of course, most welcome to come up with us, Roger. We have a special event for you. Yeah. Um, so a question for me, actually, since we're on to repeats now. Um, so with your videos, um, how, how much of the video is, how much the experience is you making the video and planning the video and how much is just what happens and enjoying the sailing? Oh, um, they're very strange things, videos. Um, because you know, the ones I make, I haven't scripted in advance. There are YouTubers who actually decide what the video is going to be about and actually write the script and then they go and, and film it. Um, and their videos are a lot tighter and more organized than mine for that reason. I just sort of go and start filming and then wait to see what, what happens. And sometimes it's difficult to work out what the story is because, um, and particularly actually funnily enough, when you sail in a group and there's someone else in the boat, because when I'm on my own, I can, I can do a lot of pieces to camera and things like that and talk about what's happening. And that's uh, sort of somehow makes sense of what's going on, but that feels very antisocial when, when there are other people around. And so you, you can end up with just a lot of GoPro footage that, that doesn't really feel like it's, it's sort of going anywhere. And yeah, I, I sort of um, grapple with that really. Um, and I'm actually thinking I, I do need to go back to doing more of the videos where I just sort of talk to the camera. I think they're actually more successful with the, with the, you know, the sailing footage as well. Um, and I also want to do more of explaining, explaining bits of equipment and things like that. They're, they're all this, all this is meant to be happening and testing boats. I tested one boat and everyone got at me because it was a modern fiberglass boat. And they said, why aren't you testing all these other boats? And I thought, well, that was the idea, but I, um, yes, the, I have, <laughs> I've just bought a house and you wouldn't believe the things that are going on in my life. Um, so <laughs> that's, and I do work. I am well at the moment working is writing a book. So yes. So, so there are things to distract me, but um, yes, I would want to do more videos that are about how I sail, you know, instructional and more boat tests. And I have got boats that I meant to be testing lined up and it's just a case of organizing my life to, to go and test them so that yes i think that was quite useful and useful for me because people do say i get in the comments i do read the comments maybe i don't always reply but i do read them and people ask very often oh do you know about this boat or do you know about that boat rather like the rog 15 earlier um and very often i've maybe seen the boat but i haven't sailed it and it's Unless you've really sailed a boat, it's a bit difficult to know. And then the trouble is, if you sail a boat just for a day, you're not really testing it either. You really want to, you know, sail a boat over a few days. Um, I, you know, I almost wonder how good boat tests are. The standard uh, yachting magazine boat test, where they just sort of sail a boat around for, for a few hours, and then they say, oh, oh, it was, you know, they they try a few on a few different courses. Um, I'm not certain how 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 much you really know about a boat from that, um, and I think you can be. Well, I don't. Yes, there you are. I'm 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 still musing about how the best way is to actually present other dinghies, but I do feel that would be a useful thing to do, and um, so that is the aim. So you'll you'll have to sort of watch this space, and and maybe I will work out how to do it. Um, but the yes, the other thing, of course, is is the is the point of view problem um, that when when I'm in the boat with the camera, you just get that point of view. And it's nice to see the boat from outside when that's done. It does really does involve me sailing into the anchorage, setting up a camera, sailing out of the anchorage, sailing back in again, going ashore, turning off the camera. Uh, yes, and all that. That's what I mean about it's very antisocial if there's anyone else sailing with me. And you almost have to say, that's what I'm going to do. I'm basically going to go somewhere and film a video. And the filming the video becomes as much what's going on as, as sailing the boat. Um, that's the trouble. 
And I have thought about drones, but I just know it will end up in the sea. The whole idea of flying a drone off a dinghy, I, I just can't see that working. It's going to end up in the sea, isn't it? You can oh, just you can know. To, um, Josh Collins so, about that. Yeah. You can show you his, his hand injuries <laughs> afterwards. Um, so next is Ross Sly. Do you want to ask a question? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, Roger, I sent you a, a personal note and you did reply and I just wanted to say uh, thank you once again for your book, uh, for all of your videos, they're fantastic. Just a couple of observations. Tonight's been great. Um, second one is that it's interesting that you're talking about doing more videos and perhaps more instructional videos and, and for what it's worth, I find your videos incredibly um, relaxing and more of a visual meditation. Um, and uh, there's plenty of other instructional videos out there. I just uh, I love the way you do it. So uh, a big thank you. And the final is a comment. I'm actually 400 kilometers from home to finish off a three and a half thousand kilometer road trip to pick up a Wellsford Navigator um, right. from, um, from my home base near Newcastle in New mm -hmm. South Wales. I drove to Adelaide and uh, I'm on my last night before I make it home tomorrow. So the new boat's out in the road, uh, hitched to the car. Some work needs to be done to get it operational, but in the space of six months, I've gone from never sailing to owning two mirror dinghies, and now I have a Welsh navigator, and the the addiction is out of control, and you're, you're to blame. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, thank you. <laughs> well, that's very nice of you. Okay, uh, Terry Brown is next. Similar story. Thanks, Roger, for everything. Um, my, I just feedback on your on your videos. Um, my wife and daughter and some of my other kids also sit and watch your videos, even though they're not really into sailing. Um, and, and we particularly love when you go into the little villages and uh, you know and show what's happening in the villages in France and, and we're really looking forward to the, the, the rest of the part two of the Netherlands um, video where you, I think you said at the end of part one you were going to go back and visit some of those little towns that, that you visited um, on the way up so mm. yeah thanks for everything and um, Yes, well, it is basically done that video. It just needs a sort of beginning and end and and then uploading, which takes days. So it probably won't happen until I come back from uh, the Il Chose uh, this weekend. Because uh, it just, yeah, you know, you need to be sort of ready to do your things on the computer. You can't really let it do that on its own. Um, so that's that's that, that's what's happening with that one. It's yes, probably going to be next week. But yes, we did um, stop at various places like Edom. It's called Edom, you might call it. I always called it Edom because that's what we call the cheese. But it appears that the place is actually called Edom. There you are. Um, and it is full of cheese. Uh, so we went there and we went back to Einkusen and, um, and so on. So, yeah. Uh, and it was because we sort of thought we would leave the challenge and stop going on these uh, things between marinas, which I sort of talked about before. Um, and uh, and as I was editing the 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 video, I thought actually it's I do try and keep them below about half an hour. Um, mostly because well I think people might get bored, but I get bored watching it because you've got to watch it over and over and over and over again. And yeah. half an hour seems about right. So I thought once it got to half an hour, I thought I'll I'll split it in two, and there's probably another half an hour. So there you are. So that's what's going on with that one. But I did actually have problems with the first one. I revised it in the computer, and then I uploaded it, and the latest revision didn't get on the ah. So there are all sorts of little flaws. It's really irritating, which I had corrected and somehow hadn't hadn't sifted through. I'm doing using Final Cut Pro and it it has a little sort of thing in the corner that tells you when it's updating itself, but it physically can upload even when it hasn't finished doing that. I hadn't realized that. I thought it wouldn't let me, but it does. It, you can you can actually upload while it's still doing its revisions. Really annoying thing is that I have a friend called Patrick. And the and the um, 
the the uh, text at the bottom because it's done it, you know it, it's um uh, sometimes people are speaking french and so but he actually spells patrick patrick the english way not patrick the french way and i typed patrick and then thought oh no he doesn't spell and corrected it and it's still wrong that's the most obvious example so this is trouble with with videos you get youtube videos you think oh it's too much effort to change it now but you you end up with these things out there that are yes that you know are wrong you can't do anything about so yeah i don't know why anyone does youtube videos <laughs> <laughs> okay uh next is gary hardy uh, thanks Kim. um roger I, I already know the answer to this question because i am a member of the dinghy cruising association but i thought maybe you'd like to um tell us why you think it might be worth australian dinghy cruisers joining the dinghy cruising association uh, oh because we're taking over the world yes well <laughs> I just want to say I admire Terry's backdrop. I should have had a backdrop. And so I didn't mention that at the time, but he's still there up on my little sort of display in, in, in front of his boat. So that's very impressive, rather than the back of my office, which is what you're getting. Uh, yes, um, we, no, we honestly are taking over the world. We've got, we've got now sections in the USA and France and um, Finland and... Oh, I've lost track everywhere. Yes, we just, yes, we're becoming the International Dinghy Cruising Association. So we'll be coming to, uh, you know, you, you won't, so shortly you won't have any choice, we'll, we'll have taken over. So that's, that's the, that's probably the reason you should join, because it's just inevitable now. Um, and, and the wonderful it, obviously, thing. Obviously, we were originally basically British and we're still very British in all sorts of ways. Um, the magazine's really good. Our journal is excellent. Everyone says this, not just me. Yes. Um, it really is very good. And the uh, subscription basically pays for the mag. The way our business model works, if you can call it that, is basically the subscription pays for the magazine. And the magazine is in hard copy. And so it can be posted to you in um, Australia. And we have a rate that picks that up and you'll end up being subsidized because we just have a flat rate for international members. Um, and then you can pay a bit less if you don't, if you're happy to have it as a PDF. Um, we have arguments about this, whether we, how we should, what, what level we should set all these things, but that's the, the position at the moment. So you do get this magazine four times a year, which is very nice. Um, and it isn't just about um, Britain. So that would be a reason. But anyway, you're already a member, so you know all this. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying this because you asked me asked ask yes. me the question, well, and I'm I'm doing this as my yes. sort of public <laughs> well, public I, position I about the. Uh... <laughs> I have a dream and a vision that one day we could have like a, a you know a Melbourne chapter and a Sydney chapter, and, or you well, know, we could, well yes, and all it all it needs is someone to volunteer to do it. That's all that um, mm. yeah. Our, 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 our method of taking over the world is just to persuade people to to be our fifth columnists in another country and they just create a, you know we don't ask for permission we just do it <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how it works and then you organize some rallies and there you are and then you've got a, a melbourne um yeah dinghy cruising association well, that's how it works very good the, the John Wellsford has his own, um, you know, does organise rallies in New Zealand, doesn't he? And he seems to have his own little thing. We haven't been successful in New Zealand because of that. Um, and here in France, there is something called the Fédération Voile Aviron, um, which does similar sorts of things. Um, they they have a problem that they don't have a word for dinghy. You can't actually translate the word dinghy into French because it doesn't exist so they talk about sailing all boats while everyone but we that hasn't stopped us having a having a french group we've just unveiled a french group so mm -hmm. there you are <laughs> thank you right uh jane puckering next hello hello how are you i'm fine There you go. Yeah, um, 
He's oh, very excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a little question. How well does um, your dinghy, Avil Drogue, um, like sail and stuff? Um, <laughs> depends what you're comparing her with. Is the is the short answer? Um, we um, I, I and I've just actually written an article for Le Chasse Marais, which is a French magazine, um, about this challenge I did in Holland last month, a uh, month before last now, and um, and that. It's called the Challenge Navigate Leger, the light boat challenge. Um, and they have all, it's started about um, 10 years ago. And so it happens every year, other than COVID caused a bit of a problem. And at the beginning, I'm answering your question. I'm just doing it a long way around. At the beginning, most of the boats were smaller than mine and they were quite light and slim and, you know, and there were two boat designers, Emmanuel Conrath of R1 Marine, I've just talked about, and another guy called Gilles Montebon, who has a, a, a boat yard called Chantier Mer in uh, so the, the west coast of France. And both of them um, designed, a bit like John Wells, but they designed cruising dinghies and build them. And they compete with each other. They use the Challenge Navigate Leger. And, and so each year they, they each come with these new designs and they've grown bigger and bigger and faster and faster over the years. So this year, you you know, there were a few of us still with old boats that we had at the beginning in 2015, which now feels like not even 20 years ago, feels like a long time ago. And we're thinking that they're all they've all got bigger and faster than us. They're all over five meters long and really slim and uh, yes, and, and increasingly it's, that's getting challenging. It's meant to be a challenge, Navigate Leger, and it is. You think, how are we going to keep up with these boats? So, yes, it, it depends. And there is, there's a popular dinghy in Britain called the Wayfarer. I don't know whether you have Wayfarers in yeah, Australia. Um, very much. There you are. Yeah, and then, really? there was one of those. Yeah. There was one of those. And they're still um, very competitive. The Wayfarer... The Wayfair is quite interesting. It's about the same size as my boat, about the same sail area. It's very definitely faster to windward. And it will also mm -hmm. plane. So in big seas, you know, with the wind behind, it will go onto the plane and so leaves us behind. Um, my boat doesn't really plane. It, it, and when it does plane, it means you've got too much sail up. You think, ooh, <laughs> it should, really shouldn't be happening. Um, so yes, yeah, so sort of when it gets up to about seven knots, you think maybe I should be stopping and reefing. Um, yeah. uh, naturally, it would go about five and a half knots, my boat. Yeah. So yeah, six yeah. knots is already too much. Seven knots is very much too much. Um, it went to just to actually put figures on it. We go to windward at about four knots in flat water. Nice. Uh, as I say, off the wind, we do about four and a half knots, three and a half knots, four knots. Uh, waves will stop us, but that we can do that. Uh, we're not as close winded as a wayfarer, though. That's why they leave us. You know, they can sail close to the wind. Uh, mm. But we, I think it's perfectly fast enough and reasonable. It's just if you end up with two boat builders competing to design faster and faster boats that get ever longer, you begin to feel a bit, yes. Like that's yeah. why my video of that Holland thing didn't have very many. There weren't. There wasn't a lot of me arriving on the shore, setting up a camera, sailing off again, and sailing in. So you've got interested point of view shots from the shore because I was struggling to keep up. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that time. makes it complete was, sense. <laughs> we used to um, set off early to be away before the rest of them, and then end up behind them at the end. Um, it was all so, a bit like that. I just have another question. Did you like the article that me and Mum wrote in your thing about what was it called? Dead water. Yeah, dead water. Oh yes, no. Oh, that's you. Of course it is. Yes, so yeah. you're called Holly, aren't you? It says. Yeah. Where does it tell me what you're called? It does. Oh, there you are. I'm over here. Yes. No, <laughs> that was an excellent article. Yes. So I forgot. I hadn't. Yes, I hadn't put you together with the. Yes. No, that was really good. Yeah, it was all about the experience of of a family. Yes, yeah, sailing a boat. 
And that's exactly yeah. That was the actually sort of us. Like, yeah, that no, that was you. Yes, and that's and that's the sort of thing that will get more um, families and women sailing. It's stuff like that. It's simply yes, addressing that because trusty well, old men on their own are not going to write pieces like that, are they? Obviously. Yeah. Not. Well, I'm um, I'm actually currently writing another one. If you'd like me to send that in. Oh, do yes, yes. Yay. I'm not the editor, of course. So he may he may reject it. He's he's grumpy like that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he does, then we'll just keep sending it until it gets through. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's time for Jean to go to bed yeah. now. You want to say good night to Mr. Okay. Barnes? Good night, Mr. Barnes. It's been a pleasure meeting you. <laughs> so, what's your name again? It doesn't. It just says Holly over here. Um, Jean. I'm oh, Jean, me. and Holly's my mum. Okay. So G E N E. Okay. <laughs> Good See night. Ya. Good mm. night. Bye. Okay, uh, Ian Habish, you're next again. Uh, yes, Roger. Thanks for making yourself available. We're sitting down with our glasses of wine and and dinner and things, and nearly ready mm. for bed. So uh, thank you for making time. Um. I guess my question is about regulations and and the reception of dinghy cruisers in places like marinas and things like that. Uh, lots. I, I wonder if it's getting easier or harder in terms of those things. When we read stuff from the US and and the UK about registration for boats, which doesn't apply to us, um, lots of the videos that are made by the Raid Group are about pulling up at a beach in a national park and it's all very wild and, and kind of uncontrolled in that sense. Uh, you, you mentioned before that, that in Australia, things tend to be, you know, 10 years behind the UK or Europe or, or the US. Uh, what's the trend there in terms of the reception of dinghy cruising, which, which seems to be a thing that, that gets in between the cracks of, of motor yachts and yachts and and marinas and things like that. Is it getting harder and more controlled or, or is it still easy to do what you do? Um, I, I don't think it was me who said Australia was 10 years behind. I'm not certain how true that is, though I did get that sense a bit in New Zealand. It felt a bit like Britain uh, 20 years ago. Um, the um, regulations, yes um boat registration uh the, the this friend i'm going to go sailing with this weekend unless we decide that the it's ridiculous to go sailing in huge spring tides because it's a really big spring tide this weekend um or a grand coefficient as they say in france um, she is lives in Switzerland and in Switzerland all boats have to be registered so the boat has a number on it even though it's a little sailing boat, it has to have a number on it. Bicycles have to be registered in Switzerland, like that. Swiss are like that. Um, in um, and I don't really know the details of that, other than the, the boat definitely has a number on it. Um, in here in France, boats don't need to be registered uh, if they didn't have engines, uh, or indeed if they have little light. A little dinghy with a little light engine wouldn't need to be registered and you wouldn't need um, a certificate of competence to sail them. Bigger boats do in France. Um, there are certificates of competence for um, boats with bigger engines and so on. In Britain, there are no regulations at all. It's just extraordinary. Um, the principle is this is for a pleasure boat. If you carry passengers, charter boats very different but pleasure boats none at all no matter how big the pleasure boat is you you can you there's no regulations about equipment um there's regulations about manufacture of boats if you're selling them uh which are actually still european regulations maybe a brexit benefit will be they don't need to apply but at the moment they still do uh, but for in terms of owning a boat there's none at all um and there's none at all about where you can sail. So just recently, a wayfarer we just talked about um, sailed around Britain nonstop. Took them two weeks, I think. So, and they were like 60 miles offshore. 
all the way around Britain. And Britain is, as I say, it's maybe not as exposed as Australia, but it's a similar sort of thing. It's mostly open ocean and the Atlantic and, you know, high latitudes and all those sorts of things, particularly at the north of Scotland. And um, yeah, no one stopped them doing that. You couldn't do that with a similar boat with a French flag, because in France, a little boat has to stay within five miles, or well, maybe six miles of shelter. This doesn't apply to my boat at the moment because my boat's still a British boat. And of course the regulations on the boat are the regulations of the flag state, not where the boat physically is. Um, so that's the sort of position. Um, the the um, registration of boats things, the reason why that ends up being talked about is there is this particular issue if you take a boat out of one country and put it in another country, um, you need to, you know, the new country will say, oh, hang on a second, what, how, do you, how can you prove that boat really is a British boat? Seeing as how you want to be able to sail more than five miles offshore with your British flag. So the registration is there really to deal with the borders rather than, you know, the friend, as a boat in France, it wouldn't need registering on a boat in Britain, it wouldn't need registering, but because it's moved from one to the other, it does. That's what's going on there. Um, wh whether, the, whether the lack of regulations is an advantage or not, that's a, a very big question. But I rather suspect that the um, the voluntary system of because what the Royal Yacht Association, which we talked about before, does is give advice about how boats should be equipped. And most British boats are equipped to Royal Yacht Association standards, even though they don't need to be, because people think, well, it's me and my family and I should be protecting them and um, rather here in France, uh, there is there are regulations about equipment of boats. These are French boats <laughs> rather than a British boat that happens to be in France. And but it is noticeable that French yachts are equipped to the standard of the regulations and no more. And that's what happens if you have regulations. People just go, oh, well, there you are. I, I'm abided by the regulations. Um, and a particular example, just to finish this off, is they have these hopeless radar reflectors, which are just a little tube about that big. And even really big yachts have them. Out there, there is a, there is a port out my window. And if I were to lean and look, I would be able to see in the rigging these ridiculous radar reflectors. And we know they don't work, of course. We know that, particularly not if they're not vertical, but the regulation says you have to have a radar reflector and they're the cheapest radar reflector. So everyone just fits them. And the fact they don't work, because everyone's just bothering about abiding by the regulation. Whereas the average British yacht has a very serious radar reflector, even though it doesn't need to, because people have looked at the, um, the advice and fitted, fitted decent radar reflectors. So um, yeah, that, there we are. That's my, that's my little speech about regulation. <laughs> there you are. Do you want to ask Happy a supplementary end. question about how this applies to dinghies? I perhaps I didn't really talk enough about dinghies. No, not so much regulations with dinghies, but just I guess the cultural response. So we love seeing your videos, and you sail up this beautiful river, and you think, well, are we just going to uh, moor to this uh, quayside here? And there's a jazz festival. How have you found the response of people? Is there a oh, sense yes, of sorry. people starting to go, oh, hang on, what are you doing there? That's a bit of a, you're taking a bit of a liberty here. Perhaps you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, sorry, I, I had a feeling I'd only answered half of your question, so thank you. Um, yes, the, uh, usually it, it's just extraordinary, the welcome you get. On, on that, at that jazz festival, which is only two, three weeks ago, um, we were actually offered flowers. I was there with a with a, a female friend, and a guy just on the quayside. He was one of the five cottages on the quayside. Um, he went into his back garden and cut some flowers and gave her some flowers from his garden. So yeah, there you are, because he was just thought it was extraordinary that we had, we had moored to this quayside, 
Um, yeah, and and it was perfectly legal for us more to the quayside. But um, yes, usually people just think it's extraordinary what you're doing. And so because we're rare and uncommon, um, one's usually welcomed. And um, you can rock up and just, you know, more pretty well anywhere in a small boat in Britain, in a small camping boat, and you never get any problems because of that. And it's it's been effectively the same in France. Um, were if it got to a point where you turned up at a little creek and the place was full of little camping dinghies and everyone was um, uh, just using the countryside as a toilet, we had the toilet question, um, that, you know, you could see that being being a problem very quickly. The, the you know, a low density of occupation, one can, one can get away with, you know, with, yeah, well, simply using the countryside as a toilet. Um, just as obviously people who go up go up mountains do, um, but that starts being problematic once you get you know quite a lot of of you know it starts being an issue, doesn't it? And I can sort of see that maybe is going to happen in the future, but we're a long way we're a long way from that at the moment. Um, so yeah, there doesn't seem any any restrictions at all really in france there is a the, the the thing about how far you can sail exercises my friends who have french registered boats well as i say they're not registered but they are because they're french they are effectively french um and i will my british reg re registration will expire in two years time so i will have to think about this uh, as well and they do worry about the five miles from an abri five miles from shelter thing so they end up drawing end up working where shelter is which around this coastline is quite a lot of it it's quite a lot of little indented bays and things and they draw little circles um when they're planning little trips together and they ensure that we remain within the circles and we're not ever more than than five miles from shelter because our boats are only class d or c uh, do you have those SOLAS categories? I think they're international. All boats are categorised, sort of a, a O is open ocean, then it goes A, B, C, D, E, and E is a sort of little dinghy you use for, you know, in a harbour, and D and C are, you know, slightly better. But, yeah, in France, they then put distances you can sail those on, and they're in national law. Um, in Britain, those are things that are only advisory, but in France, they are actually mandatory. So, um, yeah, I don't tend to, I would, I'm not sure I would want to take a, a small dinghy a long way offshore um, just for fun, but I can, you know, if I want to, I don't need to worry about it in my case. Um, and that's why I keep the, the red ensign up there, because that's what sort of says to, the French affair maritime or whatever, look, this boat, you know, you don't have any right to start telling it where it should sail because it's not your jurisdiction. And that does seem to work. I have never, um, I've never ever had French um, officials try and board the boat and stop me doing what I want to do. They do seem to know that they, they don't, you know, they don't have that right. So there you are. All right, uh, Steve Williams, you're next. Um, good evening, Roger. Thank you for taking the time to answer our questions and, and share some stories with us this evening. Um, can you hear me okay? I was just wondering. Yeah. Yeah, yes. so look, just a quick question, and it's actually sort of a two-part question. Um, your introduction into YouTube and the motivation into getting into it, um, was it a it was it about journaling or instructional or you know something like you know I just wanted to sort of clarify your how did you get into documenting your your uh, you know your boating your boating uh, interests I suppose you could say you mean on on writing or doing the videos no the videos the youtubing so it's it's uh I, I, it's just a question that I ask YouTubers that I meet, you know, what's, what was your motivation for getting into it and, and what's um, kept you, kept you doing it? 
originally i thought i having brought out a book i thought i would it would be publicity for the book the first videos i did um and just to sort of see how the thing worked really oh no i'll tell you what happened uh, it was actually i was yes um i i'm an architect and i was approached i was cold called by a company that was created to help small and medium enterprises we call them smes um to use social media and they said we've got european money and you're in the southwest of england we've got european money you can go on this free course we will organize and you'll and tell you and so they came and then a guy turned up and talked me through and he signed me into instagram and facebook and because i don't think i was even on facebook at the time he signed me into all these and youtube and pinterest and maybe some others i forget and and he, he and he <laughs> said all about how, how don't think about this as advertising you just you just create uh, and, and the whole thing the whole idea i was I had no idea about any of this. This was my introduction to this whole idea that you create a relationship with with other people, which is what obviously we all now I think know that that's how social media work. But at the time, I couldn't understand why were people doing this and how it worked and why companies might have a social media account. And then I couldn't, having done all this and gone on the course, I then thought I can't work out how I use this to promote architecture. But while I'm working that out, maybe as I have just written this book, I could try doing some because I, I had I went on YouTube and yeah. had a look at the most popular videos because um, you can do that. You can say, show me the most popular videos. And so yeah. I watched a few of them and I thought, well, they're all about um, leisure activities. Uh, that's what they're all about. That was very I couldn't find anyone. At that stage, this is like 10 years ago, promoting architecture, for instance. Now there are a few people doing it. But at the time, I couldn't work out how that might be done. So I thought I'll just to, to get I must do something with all this European money that's been spent on me. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do some. Yeah, so that's what it was. It was. So the idea was I'll do these. I'll do these sailing videos and then eventually I'll get around to doing an architecture one. And I have done one or two architecture ones. But I still didn't think they were particularly successful. But I did them because I was feeling so guilty that that was what I felt I should be should yeah. be doing. So that's what it what it was at the start. Okay. I hadn't expected. But then the surprise is that um, you start being known for your YouTube videos. And I am actually stopped in the street. It tends to happen on key sides, I have to say, <laughs> rather than up mountains <laughs> in the right environment. But that's quite a shock that, you know, when you actually find that people recognize your face and say, are oh, you Roger Barnes? Do you do these YouTube videos? So, yeah. So the whole thing is is quite bizarre that. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, okay. the, you know, the, the first time I did a video that, you know, one, my most popular video, half a million people have viewed it. And that wow. is just extraordinary compared to how many people read my articles or any other way that you you know you relate to people it is the whole thing is just extraordinary in terms of making any money it's just woeful of course but yeah <laughs> there you are okay thank you very much appreciate it all right thank you uh peter green you're next g'day roger first um i've got to say it was actually finding one of your very very early presentations to the to the dinghy cruising association on on what dinghy cruising was and and what a marvelous thing it it could be that sort of gave me the idea that such a thing existed um in, you know, and i followed your your um your videos quite closely just to i was just wondering um i suppose two quick points one is did you have any questions for us or any comments on things that you saw perhaps you, you've seen us doing which piqued your interest or any comments where you could comment that why don't you guys do this thing you know, which is really good but you, you you guys seem to have missed this oh 
Gosh, I don't think I'm as critical as that of other people's way of <laughs> way of dinghy cruising. I think I think I'd like to see people doing it differently. Um, and I think you know, different different countries tend to have different cultures. I don't really know enough. You know, I've seen um, things shared. People sailing in in Australia and Holly's piece about sailing as a family and so on. I have to say it felt very, very like how it is in Britain. Um, I didn't feel any, you know, the, the, there was a lot that was very different. Um, and part of, I, you know, I have, I have occasionally, um, someone did a, did a cruise recently. I think it may have been in the, um, in the dinghy cruising magazine, I forget. And I can remember, and it was a cruise of a few days along the Australian coast. Um, and you're going to ask me where it was, and I can't remember. But I did actually go onto um, Google Maps and have a look where it was, because I um, there, there were lots of sort of estuaries and creeks he went into, and I thought, well, that isn't how I picture the Australian coast. But there again, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big place. Um, and I do did remember looking at it and thinking, oh, that's interesting. There's a there's a yeah, because it was this big bay, and then there were these big exposed looking bay with the Southern Ocean racing past. And then there are all these interesting, um, yes, yeah, of creeks and rivers that, that he does, he sort of explored. So, um, yeah, I don't know that I have any, 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 any big comments. I'm just sort of interested to see how you, yeah, how you go about things really. Yeah, there have been comments about, you have been comments from, from Australians about, why don't I have problems with flies? Because I think so. I think you may have problems with flies, but we mostly don't. So it's something I never really talk about. Less so in winter, although <laughs> perhaps we have milder winters than you you have up there. Mm, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, thank you. Okay, uh, Terry Brown is next, and that might be the last call then. Except in the Netherlands, didn't you have problems with flies in the Netherlands? Uh, yes, uh, they didn't bite though, I should no. say. Uh, they were just there, but that was quite unusual, um, which is why um, we made so much of it. It's not really a, um, yeah, a thing where I sail, one has a problem with. North of Scotland, where, where I sail now, the north of Scotland, they have, it's really, and they do bite. Um, if you ever see pictures of people sailing in the north of Scotland, what you've got to bear in mind is that they will be battling with flies the whole time, with biting midges. Yeah. Um, but this sort of band of, of latitude, that there aren't uh, many really. I would think down in the Mediterranean it starts to be a problem again in summer. But yeah, just yeah. around here, we... we and, it, and it's funny, because of course you don't have the problem, you forget that it might be a problem for other people. And when people say, you know, how, how can you be sitting there in your boat and, you know, with the cover open in the, in the, you know, watching the sunset and not be worried about flies? And that's the reason, because there just aren't any. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> we, we have the problem with mosquitoes, of course. Mm. Yeah. But no, the, well, the we, question we, I... we, we, we don't really at this latitude. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, um, what's the, the market like for, for buying a little dinghy in, in France, <clears throat> for example? Um, so like my little heron behind me, you know, that cost me a bit over $1,000 Australian, what, 700 or so euro. Um, you, know, you know, in 2020, I was supposed to go to, to France and do it for about three or four months, but obviously that didn't happen. And, and now that I'm into this, I'm thinking, well, if I go and do that again, my plan will, well, can I sail somewhere? You know, what if I picked up a little dinghy and chugged it around and sailed around the place? Um, yeah, just interested uh, to know. The, they, France had its plywood boat revolution just as Britain did. Mm. Uh, you know, I used to have a heron dinghy. Well, well our family had a heron dinghy. Um, yes, I'm now looking at it, I'm thinking behind you, I think, oh, yes, that's a heron dinghy, there we are. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and uh, they don't really have heron dinghies, they have their own sort of classes. Um, but they, they are still there around Caravelle, they had, which was sort of a thing, it was like a mirror dinghy with a pram bow, rather larger. They had lots of those. 
um, quite heavy. You probably pick up one of those quite cheaply if you wanted to buy a boat for a for a period in in France. Uh, yeah, no, it's very similar. There's lots of that sort of era of boat, yeah. very cheap to buy. Something like an Elure, like mine, they're quite expensive because it's an expensive boat to make and there are not that many of them around. So you pay a few, oh, I don't know, people will probably ask 9,000 euros for it. Um, right. I don't know yeah. the conversion, but I should think it's probably about one to one with the, with the uh, Australian dollar. About one point four. Um, yeah, so they're they're of that order, um, of things like a new lure, uh, but that's because they're quite new and they're they're quite sought after, and also probably people think they're worth more than they actually are. You never know whether boats sell at the price they're asking, of course. Do you? I'm often yeah. I often think they probably sell for about half what they're asking. But France is very 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 sailing is a mainstream sport in France. Um, and school children in Brittany, they all do sailing classes as part of school. Um, well, yeah. yeah, it's it's actually, you know, that's why the French do so well in ocean racing. They It's really extraordinary. And newspapers always have sailing in, in the sports section. There'll always be something about sailing. So here you find it's very, very mainstream culture. And ch school children, they sail little optimists. If you have optimists yep. in... Yep. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, they're come all around here. They're sailing optimists they're in the harbour just here. They're, every day there'll be loads of children out in optimists because they, oh, you know, there's a sailing school that's in contract to the to the schools, and the children yeah. get you know an afternoon off to to learn to sail. That's how it is here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's kind of funny actually because here we'll have our adventures on Sydney Harbour, and it'll be. You know, 20 knots and white caps and we're down to the second reef and then there's little kids and opties come sailing past in the planning <laughs> class. <laughs> yeah. So it destroys your dreams. Uh, Meredith, you're next. Um, yeah. oh. oh, sorry, you're, you're muted at the moment, Meredith. Okay, you can hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just following on from that last question, I've, I've been thinking about this a little bit. So the um, the International Rowing Federation, of which I am affiliated, um, used to run probably pre-COVID um, these sort of international cruises where you could sign up and go and row in the traditional boats somewhere in the world. Um, and I just wondered whether... Um, that's something that maybe dinghy cruises could look at because we're, I suppose, we're looking at your sailing in France and and England and thinking we we'd probably like to go to some of those places, but obviously the practicalities of trailing a boat to to Europe are a little beyond most of us. Um, and I just wonder if there is a sort of um, a market or a, a future where we might be able to go and sort of join in. Um, uh, some sort of slightly organised activity like maybe what you were describing in the Netherlands um, where, you know, visiting dinghy cruises might be able to do something like that. And similarly, you know, people could come here and do something. Oh, yeah. Um, well, you, obviously, you could do that informally. You just, you know, in, in the association journal or on that Facebook page, I suppose you could simply say I'm coming is there is there someone who would take me sailing? And I'm sure you'd get someone doing that to make it. Oh, I'm going to sneeze, perhaps. Make it. <coughs> excuse me. To make it more organised requires a degree of logistic, um, you know, concentration. Which I have to say, in, in the dinghy cruising <laughs> association, we're not good at things like that. <laughs> it's all it's all basically just anarchy and an argument. So um, yes, uh, the I do know a few people who have tried to basically sort of do dinghy cruising as a commercial operation, and so the idea is, and there's a woman in um, Cornwall who's got a couple of um, sort of quite solid open boats, and they and they do actually do it. They camp actually on the beach rather than camp on the boats. 
but she sort of has weeks where you know people come sort of a family just a sort of a group and sail in her in her boats so i think that might well start happening as as i say it's all part of making people uh realize that it's possible to do and then you'll you'll start getting things like that in holland on the Friesian lakes i was um amazed to see that there are whole fleets of camping dinghies basically open dinghies we, we have a little outboard on the back because they're not like me about anti-outboards and and whole families were just taking them and they they'd come with a tent and then pick, stick the tent on the shore and uh, there are lots of Germans go to uh, Holland so I talked to one family in particular who were sailing along beside us and they were yeah there you there you are that's that's what they were doing they had just come and hired a boat to for a week and they were they were sailing around and camping on the shore of the Friesland Lakes which was just beautiful so and I'd never really I'd never been there before I was never really aware how big they were or that you could do something like that because now I think well I could have done that years ago just come and had a boat um, and gone sort of sailing around so I think this will start happening if will the dinghy cruising association start doing it as an organization I should think not but it might you know it's certainly something we'd encourage for you know members to do and then offer yeah there you are is that a good answer <laughs> that's a very good answer <laughs> yeah thank you all right um so thank you everybody actually and especially thank you roger for your time so you've been very generous for your time and i appreciate it, it must be lunchtime there for you as well it is it is on lunchtime it's one o'clock there we are yes yeah Okay, so I'm actually above a restaurant, and this is a flat, and below me there is a restaurant, and out this window there are big um, yellow umbrellas, and a terrace with, and people I can hear people eating out there. You might be able to distantly. You know, the window is open, you see, because it's all hot. You're saying, "Oh, we have the climate in in Australia. It's been hot for <laughs> weeks here. Not had any rain." Or, yeah, honestly, not had any rain for weeks. The whole countryside's dry and there's forest fires. And it's all terribly like Australia. Yeah, we, it's all like that here. Big forest fires there have been. And yes, so that's what's happening. There you are. Just get a sense of what's going on in my life at the moment. <laughs> right. Um, so on behalf of Raid Sydney, thank you very much for your time. And that was a, a fascinating evening. And um I guess best of luck with your with your writing and also with your your sailing trip if you manage to make it and the the ginormous tides you've got to get tender. <laughs>